25. And as we read these words, let us remember, dearly beloved, that uh, no prophecy came by the will of men, but holy men of God of old spoke by the Holy Ghost. Give ear now to the reading of God's holy word. A psalm of David. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth, unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Mine eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn thee unto me, and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O oh, bring thou me out of my distresses. Look upon mine affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Consider mine enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. O oh, keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on thee. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Amen. This is the word of the Lord, which is more valuable than our necessary food. Let us now sing his praise. Boys and girls, we, in our Reformed and in our Presbyterian churches, we teach you using questions. Catechism is something that becomes very familiar to us in our circles at a very young age. And our Lord Jesus Christ employed such a method for instruction. Whose coin is this? And whose superscription? do we find upon it? Well, it is not only our Lord, but it is the prophets who have gone before as well. And we find this especially in the literature that is sometimes uh, spoken of as wisdom literature, uh, that we might be, by the Spirit of God, challenged by uh, questions and made to think. So we have here in Psalm 25, verses 12 to 14, and we will be uh, reflecting with God's help, particularly upon the 14th verse. Uh, this short section opens, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Here is a, a question to get us to think, to get us to ponder, 
What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease, and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. As we sing the Psalms of David, we often, therefore, engage in catechism. What man is he that feareth the Lord? And the Holy Spirit gives us the answer. In this psalm, the believer earnestly seeks for divine guidance, pardon, and deliverance, and throughout expresses his confidence in the Lord's mercy in all these matters, that those who fear God as he does might likewise take heart. In verse 14, which is where we will be camping ourselves uh, this evening and meditating, and indeed it is a great place for us to put in our tent stakes and remain for a time. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. In this particular verse, David encourages himself and all the godly by affirming his deep confidence in the promise that God will unveil his privileged secret to them. And so in this question, we are drawn to inquire, inquire into the mysteries Inquire into the secret of God. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. Let us, with the Lord's help, uh, reflect upon this text under two points. First, we have great promise for the godly. And second, we consider the secret of that promise. First, there is great promise for the godly. The, as it were, the the catechism question drives us to think and to contemplate. But as you know, boys and girls, in catechism, we do not usually simply rest at open-ended questions. Religion is about the individual, among many other things. It involves our states of mind, our experiences. Nevertheless, our religion is not from below. It is from above. Whatever answer we may supply to this question, there is an answer. In our tradition... Our catechism opens with the words, what is the chief end of man? Well, this is not an open-ended question. Neither is the first a question that you have in your Heidelberg catechism. Your only comfort in life and death, and yes, indeed, that is a very deep and personal and experiential reality, but it is profoundly informed and shaped by objective divine revelation. And otherwise, your faith is in vain, and you are yet in your sins. Praise God that He not only gives us the questions, but the answers. And praise God that He also gives us the right questions, because let's just be honest with ourselves. The questions we often have are misguided and misinformed. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease and his seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. There is great promise for the godly. David is encouraging himself. And as he does that, he's encouraging the other God-fearers. Observe also that the question that is raised by the Holy Spirit speaking through the mouth of David is not, what man is circumcised and of the ethnic line of Abraham? He doesn't ask that question. 
Not that it's irrelevant, but that there's something more profound and deep to be asked and to be answered. For circumcision is nothing but the keeping of the commandments of God. Circumcision availeth nothing but a new creature, a new creation. That's what is deeper than the more superficial considerations and realities that carnal men get fixed upon and they rest. But they need to go deeper. Because it is not those who claim to be godly that, that as it were, uh, call for the encouragement of the Lord but rather those who are truly godly. Only they should be encouraged. And that's one great end of the gospel ministry, is to encourage the godly, who are often discouraged and cast down. Not only because of the the wicked world in which they live, they're, as it were, suffocated by the oppressiveness of a world that, that hates God, that makes it difficult for them to walk in the straight path of righteousness. But all the more, not only because of the many infirmities and the trials and afflictions which are brought, and indeed they sigh and cry and they need encouragement in in all these things, but above all these things, they need encouragement because they struggle with sin. Well, the Lord gives great promise for those who fear Him. Who are those who fear him? Who are those unto whom the exceeding great and precious promises apply? It's not just to anyone. What man, what man is he that feareth the Lord? Separate out all the chaff, brush aside. Those who do not ultimately count in the end. Oh, they may count in this world. They may have the fanfare and the applause of an evil generation. And you may be tempted, young people, to want to admire them because there they are. They are beautiful. They are glamorous. And everyone gives attention to them. And yet they fade as a leaf. And their beauty is gone. And their name is remembered no more. But here is the one that we should look for. Here is the one who counts. Here is the one to whom there are tremendous, glorious promises both for this life and for that which is to come. Indeed, bodily exercise profits little. But godliness is profitable for both this side of glory and the next. So what man is he that feareth the Lord? What does it mean to be a God-fearer, to be among the godly? Well, they, above all things, crave God. The wicked, God is not in all their thoughts. And if they do entertain him in their thoughts, it is with a suppression of the true thought of God, pressing it down in unrighteousness, or else twisting and distorting it to fit with my own sin and rebellion so that I can salve my conscience and still live opposed to God. But those who fear the Lord... The true God, as He is, the maker of heaven and earth. He, who after six days created man in His own image to represent Him, to manifest Him, and to be in communion with Him. The God, who is I am that I am. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. 
keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But not only that God, but also the God that will not acquit the guilty. I crave that God. I crave Him as He is. Not as I want Him to be. Not as my godless age wishes Him to be. The godly crave God to glorify Him and to enjoy Him forever. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. I need God. That's the, that's the most that's the most vivid and profound sign and indication of new life. As the deer pants after the water brook, so my heart pants after thee. I long for you, God. I long to know you. I long to hear from you. I cannot bear enduring your silence. My soul, as Augustine says, is restless until it finds rest in you. And dear friends, if you are not in Christ, if you do not by the Holy Spirit truly fear the Lord, you're never going to find rest. You're going to chase it. You'll chase it to the ends of the earth, but you're never going to find it. But what man is he that feareth the Lord? Those who are chasing their dreams, they don't count in the great equation. But what man is he that feareth the Lord? This is God's perspective. He looked down from heaven to see if there were any that understood and that sought after God. That's what God is looking for. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro through all the earth to show himself strong for those whose hearts are upright with him, who long for him, who desire to please him. What man is he that feareth the Lord? That is the question that this age ought to be asking. But it's not, and it won't. But here, as we approach the Lord in His ordinances, and especially the supper, which is designed for the intimate ones with God who long for Him, who don't just want Jesus' benefits, but they want Him, the cup of blessing which we bless. Is it not the cup of the communion? of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Do you long for the Lord? There is great promise. Be encouraged. The Lord doth call thee. It doesn't matter what others say. It matters what the Lord says. It doesn't matter all the frowns of the so-called righteous who don't think you cut muster. It matters what the Lord thinks. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Such as truly fear God, this great promise belongs to them. They are those who also trust God implicitly for all good things in nature and in grace who wait upon the Lord and are wholly and radically dependent upon Him for lesser things as give us this day our daily bread, but for those things which transcend the earthly. Consider Psalm 25 and verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. It's not just a box that I check. There, I've, I've done my private devotions. There, I've, I've read the Bible with my family and muttered a few prayers. 
I am radically dependent upon him. On him do I wait all the day. Further, those who fear the Lord, that man who fears the Lord, to whom there is great promise, as we shall see the promise of the very secret of the Lord, are those who obey him. Master, your mother and your brothers, they are come to visit you. My mother, my brothers and sisters are those who know the will of God and do it. Now, to be sure, the obedience that the Lord wants is the obedience that springs out of a tender heart that has known the grace of God and truth out of a heart of thanksgiving and no other, for no other obedience after the fall is even possible to be accepted by the Lord. But to obey is better than sacrifice, and the God-fearers know this. They want to please Him because of what He has done. They want to render unto the Lord whatever they have. What shall I give unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? They will yield their bodies a a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is their reasonable service. Everything that I am, everything that I have is the Lord's. What man is he that feareth the Lord? How can you not obey? How at the very least can you not want to obey, even though you struggle with your sin? And you do. Romans 7 is the constant reality that you face. But you have, if you are indeed one of these, by His grace and His grace alone, you have the law of God in your mind. And though there is that struggle, you desire to do the will of God and you will give yourself no rest until by His grace you stand up, receive the cleansing afresh once again, and go and sin no more. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Oh, there is great promise for that man, for that woman. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. But though they obey, they yet lament the remaining darkness and sin. Striking, isn't it? As we make our way through Psalm 25, how many confessions of sin there are. I've not yet attained. I've not yet attained. Paul said this. David said fundamentally No different. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity. For their small little sins? No, he doesn't say that at all. These little peccadilloes, that's how the world thinks. They don't understand the weight of the law, how deep and how expansive and how spiritual and binding it is. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. And this is David, the man after God's own heart. Do you feel that your sin is great? Is it a heavy burden to you? Do you complain to be released? from this body of sin that you drag along with you. And you would shake it and you try and you pray and you cry, but it keeps on hanging on you, this dead, stinking corpse of sin. Well, be encouraged, God-fearer. You shall be quit of this dead body before long. But until then... There must be the bearing 
and the fighting and the confessing. Even confessing not just our ripe adult sins, but the young sins of our youth. Do thou forgive my sins and faults of youth? Do you know something of that, child of God? Do you know something of that, my friend? The haunting reminders of sins long past from your childhood. And no, it may not have been murder or rape, but it was just as dirty and vile in the sight of God. And you know it. And it troubles you. The things you said to that girl on the playground. The tearing, biting, bloodletting words. The greed, the covetousness. How many of us would hang our heads in shame if we had to narrate in detail the sins of our childhood to each other. And so it is with the child of God. Even though those sins are under the blood, even though they are all forgiven for Christ's sake, there is still something of the throbbing, the residual pain for those things that we have done wrong against God and our neighbor. Do thou forgive my sins and faults of youth? And maybe someone here should not be coming to the Lord's Supper until, as he or she is able, is to set matters right. Now, some things are beyond our power. We don't know where they live anymore. We can't even remember their last name. And the Lord knows this. And the Lord can forgive, and the Lord can cleanse. But if you have brought your gift to the altar, and you remember that your brother has something against you, if it is in your power, leave your gift before the altar, go your way, and first be reconciled to your brother. Oh, but you say it was 80% his fault. You're not responsible for that. You're responsible for the 20% that's still on your conscience. You know what? some of them will probably say, I don't even remember that. And that's okay. Confess it anyhow. Get it off your conscience. And look to the Lord, for he alone can forgive. Do thou forgive my sins and faults of youth? What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. And before we move to our second and final point, consider that those who truly fear God, who fear the Lord, that they are His choice, intimate friends and companions and not just anyone. Broad is the way. Wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Now, perhaps for some of you, that point was overemphasized in your background. But let's never let it be eclipsed. We need to consider that many are called, but few are chosen. And that should only stimulate us the more to make sure we are of that number. What man is he that feareth the Lord? It is not just anyone that will be admitted into the intimate acquaintanceship of God. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Second, The secret of that promise. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. Here's the encouragement. Whatever struggles, whatever frustrations, whatever loneliness and challenges, the Lord has exceeding great and precious promises. And the greatest reward 
is the secret. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. The promise is God's friendly unveiling of his secret as it belongs to them. Now, that may seem strange talk, but once the Lord gives it, it belongs to those who receive. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And therefore, if we believe and are as little children, of such is the kingdom. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. He signs it over to them. And they don't know. They have maybe some inklings, some vague ideas, but they don't precisely know what it is until it is given to them. And even then, as they open it, as they remove the packaging and begin to explore, they realize that there is layer upon layer upon layer of blessedness and goodness in the secret that God has willed over to them. And indeed, as we know from the full testimony of Scripture, that it comes to us by way of bloody testament. No blood, no inheritance, no gift, no secret of the Lord. What is this secret of the Lord? Well, we've considered what man is he that feareth the Lord. So what is the secret that belongs to him, that belongs to her? It is, first, the intimate favor and companionship of God through his covenant of grace. His intimate favor and companionship with that sinner through his covenant of grace. It's not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but it is of God who shows mercy. Another Psalter catechism question. What man shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall dwell in the presence of God? He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to vanity. It is coming into the presence of God by way of the covenant of grace, not of works. It is of grace. The very word that we have that is translated by our English word secret suggests ideas of, of intimacy, of closeness, and of close and intimate knowledge and enjoyment. Certain things we only learn experientially after we have made vows to our spouses. We have some general ideas, but one only enters into the secret after the covenant. You see, there can be no secret with the Lord. There can be no intimacy, closeness, friendship, companionship without the covenant. And this covenant is not as the first. That is a covenant that we can no longer keep. This do and live. No, we, we cannot do. We have violated. We cannot live by this covenant. But God has made a second. And we see it with Abraham. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. This is a gracious covenant that opens the gates of righteousness. That that sinner may be proclaimed righteous, and that the righteous may enter in and come into the presence of God. 
We see this in very powerful imagery, don't we, with Moses. And it came to pass, as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. And the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door. And the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. What is this? He who made the stars, who stretched out the heavens, who filled the great basins of the oceans and the seas, and who, by the way, holds them in the very hollow of his hand that he comes and dwells and communes with one made of the dust and one whom he has by necessity cleansed and atoned for that he may come into that familiar intimate presence of God It is his intimate favor and companionship. It's not just on paper. We need the legal that the cross has secured for us, but the legal introduces us into the intimate and the personal. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, And open the door, I will come in. And I will sup with him and he with me. I enjoyed a lovely meal this afternoon, but it was not just the pleasure of the meal, but all the more of the companionship. We weren't meant to be alone. And dear friends, we need more than simply flesh and blood to complement us. We need God. And by his grace, he has provided this through the covenant. But there's more. There are layers upon layers, as it would seem fit of God, whose ways are not our ways, whose thoughts are not our thoughts. His secret is his law. His will, his good will for man. And that's very clear when we simply interpret verse 14 within itself. Oftentimes we have a, in Hebrew poetry a parallelism. The second part sheds light on the first and the first on the second. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him and he will show them his covenant. Now... There are many things that we can say, but we must observe that within context, and especially of the Old Testament, that the law, the will of God was made known as his covenant. He made a covenant with his people, a law to a thousand generations. And this does not contradict by any means that covenant of grace. No, in fact, The covenant of grace has within its very womb this law of God that we have broken and is now to be restored with those in covenant with God. John Calvin says, God will faithfully discharge the office of a teacher and master to all the godly. And that's exactly what David is is longing for. Show me your way. Guide me in your path. Now what's he talking about? What job he's supposed to take? That's not to say you shouldn't pray that God would not give you light and guidance about who you're to marry or what job you should have. But more, it's that, Lord, you would open my eyes that I might behold the wondrous things out of your law. Show me. It's not enough for these to be on the tablets of stone. I need to be shown. 
I need you to remove the lies and the deceit and to lead me in that good path. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him, and He will show them His covenant. They desire to know it in its spirituality and extent, and God will indeed show it to them. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Here is the promise. Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. He'll teach him. He'll school him. He'll train him. Now, yes, the law, apart from Christ, only condemns and terrifies But through God's grace, the Lord does a new thing. And He doesn't scrap His law in the process. No, He magnifies His law and makes it honorable through His grace. The promise, if you fear God, He's going to give you greater access and knowledge in His revealed will. Consider Psalm 111, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, a good understanding of all they that do His commandments. They will know more and more its goodness, its suitability, its wisdom for us. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. This is not legalism. This is grace. The promise that God gives to those who fear God is that they will know him more. This is life eternal, that they may know thee, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. And more, he will not just teach them By His written word, He will give His Spirit. This law will be in the hand of a justified sinner, the rule of life for the godly. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. Now, this cannot be understood apart from the free and undeserved love of God. We love God because He first loved us. But out of this, out of this, God is designed that we should receive this law that we have broken and that it should no more be there to harass us and to break us down as we have Christian beaten by Moses for Moses knows not how to show mercy but that this very law should be placed into our hands as a staff to walk in this veil of tears, to be unto us a lamp in darkness and a light to our path. And this should bring great encouragement to the child of God who seems to be in darkness. I I don't know the way to go, O God. I feel so tempted. I feel so torn. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease. Oh, but what about my children? I've taken care for those as well. His seed shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. They will know it experimentally, having tasted its sweetness by experience, for they have been taught of God. By reason of use, more and more they have their senses exercised to discern between good and evil. But there is Something else we should say. That is, the end of the law is Christ. We are to know nothing of the law but in Christ. The law is our schoolmaster. 
to bring us unto Christ. Do not take up the law outside of Christ. Be silenced by the law. Humble yourself. Lower yourself by the law. Confess your sins as as David did by the law. Do not seek to go about and establish your own righteousness by the law. But let the law lead you as a schoolmaster to Christ, whether for the first time this afternoon, and may it be for those of you who are not in Christ and do not fear God, And your mind is is enmity against the law of God. It is not subject to it, neither indeed can it be. Or whether as a genuine Christian, as a new creation, a believer in Christ who does delight in the law of God after the inward man, let that law ever and again take you back to Christ. Because God tells of a new covenant that he would make with his people. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. Which my covenant they break. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. And write it in their hearts. And there's the secret. Listen close. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. We'll have communion with him. And we will not lie to ourselves. We will not say we have no sin, because if we do that, we make God a liar, and the truth is not in us. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, and we confess our sins with the assurance that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will dwell with us. He will commune with us. And he will reveal more and more of himself. More and more of his ways. More and more of his son. And more and more of his precious law. A law that only Christ fulfilled. Really, there's only one man who can truly answer this question as himself, and that is Jesus Christ. Because strictly considered, who fears the Lord? There is none. There's none righteous. There's none that seeks after God. They've they've all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. But there is one who feared the Lord all his days, whose meat and drink was to do the will of his Father. And not only in his sufferings and being crucified under Pontius Pilate, but every day of every week, every hour of every day, every minute of every hour, he longed to do the will of God to do it as a substitute. This is the mystery. This is the secret. Eye has not seen nor ear heard. These things are beyond man. Who has considered such things? But the Lord has resolved our deepest enigmas and puzzles. He obeys the law and so enters the most intimate place He pays the great price for the breach of God's covenant there. There is the secret, is the cross, the wondrous cross. That through this, we may be restored to God and have communion with God and that he should make a willing people in the day of his power. And this is the law of faith as Paul speaks. Moses describes the righteousness of the law, that the man that does these things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in a different way. Don't try to ascend into heaven. Don't try to go into the depths to accomplish some great thing. No, the word is near you. 
even in your mouth and in your heart, the word of faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. This is the secret. And the secret, although we could never have imagined it, is a secret that does not exclude the law, that does not trample upon it, but takes it and honors it and restores it and then places it within us and makes us long to know him and to obey him more and more out of gratitude and not out of debt. What man is he that fears the Lord? The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Be encouraged. Be encouraged if you fear the Lord. Are you such as fear the Lord? Well, then this promise belongs to you. And the exercise of examining ourselves as we come to observe the Lord's Supper is to see if indeed we have that principle of life that faith, and by the work of His Spirit, that fear, that regard for God as a child to the Father through grace, if that's the case, this promise belongs to you, and the table belongs to you. But if not, this promise has nothing to do with you. And don't take it or claim it for yourself. And do not come to the table and partake of things that do not belong to you. These things do not belong to you if you think it is easy to fear God. It is not easy. And fearing God is not a common thing. It's a supernatural thing. This promise does not belong to you if you keep the law according to your standard, an artificial standard that you've kept for yourself. If you keep it only outwardly or to be seen of men. What man is he that fears the Lord? This promise does not belong to you, the secret of the Lord. If that is your righteousness, if it, is, if it does not exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, it cannot be skin deep. It's got to be deeper. This promise and this secret does not belong to you if you do not walk in secret with God. If God is not familiar to you or you to Him, that's not saying that your prayer life is perfect. Far from it. And you confess it to Him. Lord, I'm sorry again. I've, I've ranted like a heathen man. Forgive me. Wash me and embrace me. This is your promise. Lord, take me back. You stand at the door and knock. I hear your voice and I welcome you in. Please come. I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but you have chosen to come and to dwell with such are as of a broken and a contrite heart. This is your promise, Lord. The secret of the Lord is not yours if you have no real delight and relish for God's will. If you only know God's covenant here, and not in some way meaningfully here. If you do not mourn for your remaining darkness and sin, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. If you can come just dragging yourself with tears in your eyes, this table is yours. But it's not even the tears so much as it is the state and the frame of the heart. For thy name's sake, O Lord, pardon mine iniquity, for it is great. I need what is in this bread and in this wine, 
what it represents and seals to me by the Holy Spirit. If these marks are upon you, then you are yet in the flesh and you must be born again. Examine yourself. Examine yourself. Spurgeon said, Gospel privileges are not for every pretender. Are you of the seed royal or no? Goodwin said, as a child and a jeweler, look upon the same pearl. They call it by the same name, yet the one knows it, the other really doesn't. Do you know something of the secret of the Lord? It's not, it's not this feeling. Please, please, don't be mistaken. There must be feelings, but it's not feelings that are the secret of the Lord. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. If you can find something, not some great level, some great degree, but something of the essence of that genuine faith, of that sincerity of that humility, of that broken-heartedness, of that childlike longing to be in the presence of God, to come into the secret place of the Most High, to abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He beckons you. He beckons you, not as one who is sufficient, but as one who is insufficient, not as one who is full, but one who is empty. If anything, this week, find emptiness. Find emptiness. And then take heart and be encouraged. The weakest, the weakest saint, the weakest believer, he beckons to him. He opens his arms. He says, come unto me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Away with your excuses. Away with your laundry list of disqualifications. I've covered that in my blood. Come to me. Commune with me. Do not insult me by holding back with some false piety and not coming to dine with me and to receive freely these gifts and tokens of my love. Oh, see the heart of God and take heart. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Amen. Let us pray. Again, O God, we humbly ask that Thou would grant Thy secret to us, a secret that is revealed, that is hidden in plain view. But, Lord, we need eyes to see. Show us, Lord, show us these things. We pray, Lord, even for those who struggle. We pray for backsliders that, Lord, this week Thou would draw them once again unto thyself. And Lord, that thou would satisfy the longing soul 